Do you find yourself thinking about the worst possible scenario? This is called catastrophizing, and it's a cognitive distortion that's common in people with depression or anxiety. In this video, I'll explain what it is, what causes it, and share several strategies to overcome it. Let's look at an example. Max believes he will fail his accountancy exam, even though he attended all lectures and studied hard. Max assumes, I'll fail my exam and I'll never find a job. Or we can look at Joanne, who had a small disagreement with her partner and concludes, he's going to leave me and I'll die alone. Both Joanne and Max are catastrophizing. They are making catastrophic predictions about future events which are blown way out of proportion to reality. Since catastrophizing involves thinking about terrible things that are unlikely to happen, over time it erodes your emotional well-being. There's actually a direct correlation between catastrophizing and common mental health issues such as anxiety and depression. There are three main causes of catastrophizing. The first cause is ambiguity. Ambiguity can open you up to catastrophic thinking. For example, Sue's manager sent her an email that read, can you come to my office first thing tomorrow morning? As the manager's email was very vague, Sue started to think, I'm going to lose my job. The manager's email was neither positive or negative, just vague. But the ambiguity in the email triggered catastrophizing. Fear can also open you up to catastrophizing. For example, Peter's GP called him in for his first over 50s health checkup. Peter had thoughts of, what if I'm seriously ill? My wife and children couldn't cope without me. They'll end up homeless and on the streets. Fear, particularly irrational fear, plays a big part in catastrophizing. Peter is scared of going to see his GP, even though it's only a checkup. Did you know your brain has a bias to think negatively? This also contributes to catastrophizing. For example, do you find you recall insults more than compliments or dwell on unpleasant events more than pleasant ones? Well, that's the negativity bias and it's an evolutionary response. In order to survive, our ancestors were continually scanning their surroundings for threats such as predators or rival hunter-gatherer tribes. The attention to these negative stimuli played an essential role in their survival. Fast forward in time and our bodies and brains still perform this function today. So what can you do about catastrophizing? The first step is to notice your thoughts. You might notice words such as never, terrible, fail, useless or rejected, which can lead directly to catastrophizing. For example, if I admit I don't know something at work, they will think I am useless and fire me. I'll get rejected if I ask him for a date. My presentation will be terrible and everyone will laugh. Catching yourself using catastrophic language may take some practice, but when you notice it, you might say to yourself, that's catastrophizing. Labeling your thoughts in this way enables you to distance yourself from the content of the thought. It also helps you recognize a negative thought for what it is, a thought rather than a real concrete object. Remember, thoughts are not facts. Just because you think it doesn't mean it's true. Step two, maintain perspective. For example, when George walked into the staff room, two colleagues stopped talking. George thought, they're talking about me. To gain perspective and focus on the reality of the situation, George asked himself a series of questions. What is the evidence my thought is true? Could I be misinterpreting the evidence? What assumptions am I making? After asking himself these questions, George started to consider other explanations for the colleague's actions. For example, perhaps they were discussing a private issue and didn't want anyone to overhear. Step three, learn to soothe the body. Ian is driving home with his two children in the car. He has the thought, what if I have a car accident and my children die? 
Although the thought is unrealistic, his body responds as if the scenario is going to happen in real life. His heart starts to race, he feels sweaty, lightheaded and starts to tremble. Ian's body is preparing to face an intense situation as his fight or flight response is triggered. The good news is that you can dampen the fight or flight response by practicing self-soothing. This involves creating sensations that tell the brain there's no emergency here. This helps calm the body's alert system so the brain can regain its ability to think and plan. Self-soothing activities can vary for everyone as we are all soothed by different things. Self-soothing activities include meditation, talking to a good friend, spending time in nature, exercising, listening to music, stroking a pet, the sensation of rocking and sipping a warm drink. Experiment and see what works for you. Self-soothing works by changing your physiology and stimulating your parasympathetic nervous system, which in turn can stabilise your thoughts and emotions. The parasympathetic nervous system acts like the brakes on a car. It slows you down and produces a calm and relaxed feeling in the mind and body. By learning to trigger your parasympathetic nervous system, you will reduce your anxiety, lift your mood and even strengthen your immune system. If you'd like me to make more videos like this, please give it a thumbs up. You may also be interested in the video on the screen now. Just click the screen to view the video. I look forward to seeing you soon.